Hey everybody, it's me, Lady Ada, on this lovely evening here in Manhattan at the Ada Fruit headquarters in Soho. With me is Tim O'Reilly, who's on a book tour, and uh, this is a single spot book tour. You're like just here for me. That's right. Which well, is awesome, and this is your book. That's right. The book, the book is called uh, WTF, uh, What's the Future and Why It's Up to Us. And it's really about all this fear that people have that technology is going to eliminate jobs. And actually, uh, 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 you're actually part of the conclusion of the book because you, you're Hopefully one, the good part. Yeah, you're one of the people who I say gives me hope about the future of the economy. You know, they say, oh, you couldn't do manufacturing in America. Guess what? You're doing it in Manhattan. I'm doing it right now. Like the oven's on. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. And you kind of have this amazing story about how you basically amplify your own creativity with all these machines. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's not that the machines take away work. They make the work possible. Yeah, what's interesting is, you know, I haven't read your book because I think it just came out. And you're sending me a copy. Thank you. I am. One of the things that I thought was interesting is people say, well, you can't do, like, electronics manufacturing, for example, in New York. But that's actually the one kind of manufacturing I think is most New york -y because it's small, it's expensive, and it's very automated. So you need very skilled people who are, like, able to read components and maybe do test procedures. It's not, like, stamping out metal necessarily, but it's much more automated. You saw the line over there, and it's... Parts go in, words come out. But you also are really showing off how much it's a creative business. You know, you, you talked about, you know, the, you, you get this new machine, eliminates this, you know, mechanical part of the work, and people get to spend more time doing the smart stuff. Yeah, we have uh, team members who used to like hand stencil boards or they like manually place or solder components. And because we now have a selective solder machine or a stencil machine, these are machines, uh, the this, this selective solder machine is actually made in California. Um, but those people who are doing those tests are now able to do more high level tasks like management, work order um, production, uh, writing iOS apps, um, writing an education system inside of Adafruit, writing guides and tutorials. So. It, you know, it's it's taking away people from the labor that honestly people don't really like doing anyways. Extremely repetitive labor and kind of bringing them up to the more fun brain creative stuff, which is what usually people want to do. The other thing that's so amazing about you and your operation here is that you give everything away, and yet it seems to make you more successful. And I know. <laughs> Who taught me that? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that's just such an amazing lesson for the economy as a whole. You know, we have this hoarding mentality. And one of the things, you know, that people are afraid of is that, you know, we're not going to have enough to go around. And you're kind of demonstrating that when you give away uh, your ideas, you actually amplify them. There's more demand for what you do. And it kind of seems like that's the fundamental story of technology, how we make the world better for everyone through generosity. And you, you didn't sign the NDA on the way in, huh? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, there are too many places that think that way, and it's crazy. You, no, know? you can't even go to like a seminar, though. You have to sign NDA. It's like, what is going on? Yeah, so there's sort of some new rules of business and, and kind of this new economy. I think one of the things that I talk about in the book is, you know, one of the lessons of technology is you have to actually imagine kind of an unthinkable future. And so much of what we wrestle with in the policy discussions of today, we also have to think an unthinkable future. So what if the, you know, all these technologies are so productive, AI and you know, this sort of rapid manufacturing and the machines do more and more of the work, what are we gonna do? Well, guess what? We'll figure it out if in fact we're generous and we make sure that the fruits of all that productivity get spread around. Yeah, it says, I remember somebody once said it's, um like, you know, I'm from Boston, and, it's, and the idea that if Boston, uh, you know, if we hadn't uh, outsourced jobs or mechanized jobs, it's like, well, we would still be making fabric and lin, right? That's what Boston yeah. was known for as a textile industry, but now it's a technology and finance and, and creative center. And more people are happier than they were in the mills, I think. I mean, we still have some interesting mills with recycled materials, but right. more people are able to do more. We have more that's, that's output. Right. That, yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, the, the interesting thing is whenever you use technology to do more rather than just cut costs, you cut costs for a reason, so you can do more. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think Amazon has really demonstrated this. They put 45,000 robots in their warehouses and added 250,000 people because they said, wow, now we can up the ante and do same day shipping of a lot of, I mean, same day delivery of a lot of products. Yeah, we were um, recently, we just actually did a big stats analysis on getting an auto bagging machine with like a, a you know, a, a thermal yeah. printer. And the reason we did that is we're like, well, we want to get more products in stock faster. 
And this is something that will help us speed up a lot. And also people are like, yeah, you know, I would rather use this machine than bag parts all day. And all that means is we'll be able to make more designs. Like there's still going to be just as much work. It'll just be more interesting and like yeah. lucrative work. And we'll be able to make new products because new business is the business, right? right. You, so have you, to, spend, you have to keep going. You spend more time thinking about, uh, you know, what people might want, figuring out how to, how to, create wonderful new things yeah. as opposed to just the, the, the drudgery of making it. You talked about one of your machines where uh, it, the thing spent, uh, there's a program spends six hours optimizing the placement and then tells the humans where to put the parts. Yeah, it's the, um, it's the job manager for our two pick and place machines. The pick and places have six nozzles and 10 nozzles and then there's like a hundred feeder bays. And so, you know, the machine takes time to travel and you want to minimize that travel time. So my joke is that this is like the ultimate traveling salesman problem because you have basically, you know, 10,000 points of data and you have to like optimize the matrix to figure out where do you put the feeders based on the design that you made to minimize the amount of time taken because every second on the pick and place is a second that it's not doing something else. So, you know, when we run the job splitter that takes this info and, and tells us what to do. It takes like hours, but then it spits it out. And then otherwise we would have to sit there and like tweak settings for like, I don't even know how, I don't, nobody would do it. That's we would right. probably just be inefficient and say, well, we give up, we just want to be inefficient. So kind of neat. That's okay, here we're at the machine. So I can talk about some of the machines and the automation that we've done here. So this is a board loader. This spits out boards. We used to hand feed them, but that means every time we need a board, someone have to get up every 10 seconds or 30 seconds. So they would be stuck here feeding boards, but now they can do like work order management, kitting parts, replacing feeders. So it's much more efficient. It feeds it right into the pick and place. It feeds it right into the stenciler. We used to hand stencil. So it's interesting, the stenciler, it's not faster than hand stenciling, but it's much more precise, which means your yields go up, which means there's less rework and repair and waste because because otherwise you just throw away the boards if they don't come out right. But a really good quality stenciler means your yield goes up a lot. So now our yield is at 98, 99%. That's really good because it's less electric waste going into basically dumpsters. Uh, and over here we have the two pick and places. So this one has 10 nozzles and this one has six nozzles. And yeah, we, this is the job splitting thing where it, it tells us where to put these components to optimize the speeds so that this takes exactly half the time, this takes exactly half the time. So as the first board's going through to the next one, the second one pops in. It has to be like right. balanced. So this is the assembly line. This is a line, yeah. And then, yeah. And then the oven. Um, also, you know, we got a, a long oven, so the throughput is very high. Right, it takes a while to heat up, but because we run the machine all day, you know, it brings up after 20 minutes, it heats up, and then boards can come in as quickly as you want, as long as it's yeah. as fast as the conveyor belt. Right. It's pretty cool. Yeah. So, Some of the things we've done. Yeah, kind of. This is the, the kind of the automation in service of creativity. And uh, anyway, the, the thing I guess uh, just, just to book. talk about this. Yeah, uh, the book is really about why we should not fear technology. That what we should fear is the way we're using it wrong. You know, when we use it to replace people instead of using it to empower people to do things that used to be impossible. And, you know, that's why I kind of say, you know, what's the future and why it's up to us. And, I, you know, I just feel like we have to choose to, to make an economy that puts people to work, that does work. You know, I, this is a great statement by Larry Summers, the economist, where, where he, uh, his refutation of the, um, what they call the efficient market hypothesis. And he yeah. said, markets aren't efficient. There are idiots, look around. Yeah. And I, my refutation of the uh, idea that we'll, you know, that machines will put everybody out of work is like that. There's work to be done, look around. Yeah. You know, there's so much needs to be done and there's so much opportunity for creativity. And I, what I love about what you have demonstrated over the years again and again is how the machines amplify your talents and make it possible for you to do more and how you're putting you know, hundreds of people to work in, a, in an industry that you would never imagine. You guys started on Wall Street, for Christ's sake, yeah. you know, in a little apartment. Wall Street. Yeah. <laughs> and here you are, you know, you're on four floors now here? Yeah. Amazing. Three, yeah, three, three floors. We have uh, one full floor and two half floors. 50,000 square feet. Amazing. There's a lot of space. And, and it, we couldn't have done this without the automation that we put in place. The, you know, we have the Bantam tools machine, the 3D printers, the laser cutters, the pick and place. All of these pieces make it possible for us to do it here. It, you know, it's not a question of, oh, if we get this machine or we don't get this machine, 
you know, you, this person's out of a job, this is not out of a job, you know, we've never replaced anybody with a machine that, that, they, that they then right. didn't go on and do something more interesting to them, but we wouldn't be able to do this at all. You know, it, we, 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 if this wasn't for automation, we wouldn't be able to do this in New York, but because the automation is so good in electronics, like we really figured this out, it's possible for us to focus on guides and videos, interviewing famous authors, <laughs> uh, you well, know, I, hanging out. So it's, it's working I get out. to interview uh, sort of famous designers. Sorry. And uh, I wanted to make a note that we, uh, we did this bootstrap. So we, you know, I started out of a dorm room and then I, you know, I kind of put kids together in little cups and I hand soldered things. And then I saved up enough money to buy a small picking place. And then when we outstripped that, you know, you remember the little metal yeah. locks? And then after we outstripped that, you know, I, I saved more and more money and then we, you know, flunked down for this yeah. really nice Samsung machine. And then we were hand stenciling and then after we, the revenues got higher, we bought a stenciler and then we bought an oven. So, and then we bought another picking place. So it's, it's slow and steady, but. Um, I think that's a really important point, you know, and actually I, I do have a chapter about that too in the book, uh, about this idea that it's all about Silicon Valley investment. And, you know, to me, the, you know, one of the reasons I've always admired you is that you have built your business from nothing. I'm stubborn. I did the same thing. And yeah, we're stubborn people. It's, possi <laughs> it's possible, and we have to actually build a new uh, vision of entrepreneurship that isn't about, well, you need to get lots and lots of capital. And we also need to think about what are the technologies and what are the enablers of more you know, small businesses like the ones that you and I run. Yeah. For me, you know, success isn't defined by just the bank account number. It's do we have good people here who have good jobs, good wages, good benefits, yeah. and are we impacting the world in a positive way? For me, that's success. It to totally. And I, that's why I can't be. I can't be in the Bay Area. <laughs> and, and that's why uh, uh, you're actually uh, part of the conclusion of my book here on page three six three sixty nine. The section it's up to us. Uh, it just talks about uh, exactly what we're talking about now. How you know, you have built this amazing business. And I talk about other amazing businesses that them. give me hope for the future. Yay, okay, so where can they pick up this book? Uh, well, it's gonna be uh, in stores uh, starting October 10th, and uh, you can pre-order it now. Okay, sweet, so go to your favorite bookseller and uh, get What's the Future and Why It's Up to Us by Tim O'Reilly. Thank you for visiting, Tim. Oh, thank you. A, A pleasure. <laughs> Always fun to see you guys. Thanks, everybody. Yeah.